Now, I would request Dr. Sandeep Bansal to come and deliver his lecture. Dr. Sandeep Bansal, it is MD Internal Medicine from PGI Chandigarh, and he did his GM Cardiology and DNB Cardiology. He obtained MNAMS, FESC, and he is a consultant cardiologist, presently working as professor and head of the Department of Cardiology at Vardhaman Mahavir Medical College and Safdarjang Hospital in New Delhi. Dr. Bansal. Uh, over the next uh, 25 to 30 minutes, my job is to take you through salient features of uh, the catheters, the guides, the wires, uh, talk a bit about uh, endomyocardial biopsy and contrast-induced nephropathy, and some little spotters. Uh, the basic purpose uh, here is, uh, one, to go through the gamut of uh, the equipments that we use and also try and highlight uh, some points that we as examiners think uh, are important and uh, we tend to ask you guys. Now, uh, these are the important equipments that we use in the uh, laboratory and these are going to be important from our point of view. Uh, when we talk of sheets and the vascular access, uh, one of the major uh, things that uh, uh, the, 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 the people or the examiners tend to ask you is the difference between the Seldinger technique and the modified Seldinger technique or what we call as the <coughs> anterior puncture. Uh, the difference is pretty clear in the Seldinger technique. As you can see in this picture, you go, uh, you know, beyond the posterior wall and then you withdraw it and uh, when the, once the blood comes, then you put in the guide wire. Whereas in anterior puncture, you're feeling the uh, vessel very well. And uh, when you abut the anterior wall with the puncturing needle, you can actually feel the pulsations. You just dip it a bit, and once the flow comes, uh, you don't go uh, beyond the posterior wall in this uh, particular axis. Uh, this has been important, particularly uh, ever since the coronary proce or the, the procedures started to come in because uh, we give heparins and we give other blood thinners and if you have a posterior puncture too you may have a greater tendency to bleed. Uh, no. This is the uh, difference between, uh, I, I was telling you the difference between the Seldinger technique and the modified Seldinger or the anterior puncture. Now talking of the sheets, uh, as you're all aware we have uh, very long sheets available now. Uh, <clears throat> typically up to 90 centimeter sheets. So uh, we may have a 27 centimeter long sheet, we may have a 40 uh, centimeter long sheet, and we may have a 90 centimeter long sheet. Uh, this particular sheet that is shown over here is a very specific type of sheet called the Balkans uh, sheet. We used it uh, a couple of days ago. We had a, uh, you know, a superficial femoral artery uh, stenosis in which uh, we had to use a crossover sheath. So these sheaths are particularly helpful in the peripheral uh, angioplasties. Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, for a subclavian stenosis, typically, for example, when you're approaching from the femoral side, you need a much longer sheath, a 90 centimeter sheath. So the length of the sheath will uh, largely be uh, able, uh, I mean, all these sheaths will be able to deliver uh, the, the uh, guide wires and the balloons and the uh, stents that you need to take across in peripheral arteries. Now talking of catheter, uh, this is the particular definition of catheter, which is a hollow flexible tube for insertion into a body cavity duct or vessel to allow the passage of fluids or distend a passageway. Catheter was first typically used in urology. and. Uh, the main factors or the main characteristics that we use uh, for determining what guide to choose, they are highlighted here. The size of the catheter, the shape, the length, the side holes, and of course the sheath that we talked about. Uh, the basic reasons why we catheter, uh, where, where, why we use these uh, guide uh, catheters, the role of the guide catheters is highlighted here. Uh, <coughs> we also know that the <coughs> sizing of the catheters is done based on their outside diameter in French. And uh, 
the typical internal diameters of each French size, they are highlighted uh, over here. Uh, so uh, a six French catheter will have uh, an outer diameter of approximately uh, 1.98 uh, uh, millimeters. And uh, uh, so uh, these are the typical uh, outside diameters and of different French size catheters. Now, one important thing that people are uh, very fond of asking uh, is uh, what is the primary curve and what is the secondary curve uh, of a given catheter. We've already seen a very uh, detailed exposition about uh, in geography and uh, the, the tip of the catheter which engages the coronary is essentially the primary curve. The curve closest to that is the primary curve and the next curve which stabilizes the catheter to the opposite side of the aorta, uh, opposite wall of the aorta, that is the secondary curve. Another important point to remember is uh, that in diagnostic catheters, whatever may be the size of the catheter, let's say even up to uh, a seven uh, French catheter, the internal, the, the, the tip of the catheter tapers down to a five French size. And uh, the catheters, the size of the catheter, that's another important thing. How do you, how do you say this is a Judkins 3.5 or how, how do you say this is a JL4 catheter or a JR5 catheter? So that sizing of that catheter is done by the primary, the distance between the primary and the secondary curves. So that is the factor which determines the size of the curve. That is another important point to remember. So you have these uh, typical uh, Judkins left and right catheter. These are, and these we use every day. Uh, and we also see the primary and the secondary curve. Now, we also have the guiding catheters or the guide catheters. So what is the basic difference between a diagnostic catheter and a guide catheter? As you can see in this, the diagnostic catheters in blue, they <clears throat> they have a smaller in inner lumen for the same size. So the guide catheters are, um, they, they have a bigger lumen and there is a difference in the structure. As you can see in this picture uh, at the bottom, uh, you can see that there is a stainless steel braiding between the inner and the outer jackets of uh, the catheter and that is not there in the uh, guiding catheters. So diagnostic versus guide catheters, what are the differences? One is that the shaft of the guide catheter is stiffer. The guide catheters have larger internal diameter and they have, they, they are shorter and more angulated tips. And of course, as I said, there is a reinforcement of the construction because in the middle there is a stainless steel braid which provides support and stiffness to the guide catheters. So let me ask you this question. How do you decide the guide size? So how is the guide size uh, decided? When do you, I mean, what makes you, what structure makes you decide that you have to use this size guiding catheter? Uh, anyone can, uh, okay. Uh, it is basically based on the aortic root size. So if you have a larger aortic root, you will use a bigger size uh, catheter. <coughs> now this uh, actually uh, uh, Dr. Ajay Kirtane also showed, uh, if you find that on your catheter you have this kind of uh, a pressure curve, what is it that you should not do among all these uh, things which have been highlighted here? Uh, that is advance or retract the catheter or aspirate or inject. The basic important thing is never inject through a damped uh, a catheter like this unless you, ha you are extremely certain as to what is happening. Uh, there is a flip side of the story. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of years ago, uh, I remember Dr. Samuel Matthews had shown a left main angioplasty wherein he had uh, you know, he hooked in the guiding catheter and there was a sudden vessel spasm as uh, Dr. Ajay showed. And he asked the whole uh, audience, 
uh, look, the pressure is 70. Should I give this patient nitro or not? And the answer is yes, you should give nitro if you think that this is a vessel spasm that is occurring uh, over there. But never inject if you have a gross dampening of uh, 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 the uh, gross dampening of the pressure. Now, what do you do when you have that kind of a waveform? You change the position of the catheter. You check for the transducer, and you may you may be sure you need to make sure by aspiration that your lumen is absolutely free. Uh, next, these are the various types of catheters. Uh, on the top left, you can see the Judkins left catheters, then the Judkins right catheters, and then you have the extra backup catheters. Uh, starting in the bottom line, you have the typical Emplats left and the Emplats right catheter. You have the hockey stick catheter, and um, <coughs> you also have the multipurpose catheter and a single IMA catheter. <coughs> Uh, the guides, they belong to different families as I just discussed. So this is to recapitulate uh, that once again. Uh, you have guides with side holes and those with no side holes. Uh, this typically is uh, present or useful in the right coronary cannulation. Uh, many a times we find that as soon as we hook uh, the right coronary catheter, there is a, there is a damping because of a proximal uh, obstruction. So in that case, uh, we tend to use catheters with side holes. There are advantages and disadvantages of these. Uh, one thing is uh, the advantage is that it prevents the uh, uh, damping. Um, <coughs> uh, the second thing is that uh, it allows additional blood to flow in while you are changing your equipment through the side hole. The blood flow can continue into the coronary artery so uh, the patient uh, uh, can stay relatively free of angina. Uh, the flip side of this is that this is just a false sense of security because you're actually measuring the aortic root pressure and not the coronary perfusion pressure. But all said and done, in, in some given cases where you have damping, uh, these, the presence of these side holes, uh, it helps you in the presence of these side holes help you help you in comf you know comforting you giving you whatever that false sense of security that is there and also in perfusion of the coronary while you are changing the uh, wires uh, <clears throat> one thing about amplats the in amplats as you can see the secondary curve it's not possible okay it's possible to show with this with this arrow, you can see that the secondary curve of the amplats actually rests against the non-coronary posterior aortic cusp. And amplats is, amplats, uh, <coughs> in amplats catheter, uh, it is extremely important to know as to how you disengage. This, this, gives, this gives you a lot of extra support um, as a guide catheter. But what is important is how to disengage the amplats catheter. And to disengage, you don't need to pull it because if you pull it, you will cause an osteal dissection. So you need to push the catheter to disengage and then, uh, you know, turn it clockwise or anti-clockwise and then pull it out. Uh, this, the disengagement of the Amplats catheter is quite important. Then sometimes your guide is not so stable and you need to stabilize the catheter. The, I will be discussing uh, stabilizing the catheters or supporting the catheters a bit uh, later also. But by and large, these are important techniques. You can put in a buddy wire. You can put in a wire uh, across the same vessel in which the lesion is. You can put a wire in another branch to support the guiding catheter. You can have a choice of a stronger guide. You can use an anchoring balloon. Means over the wire, you take a balloon, you inflate at low pressure and you use it as an anchoring balloon. And you can also change the sheath to uh, a supporting uh, one. Dampening of pressure, uh, we just discussed. If there is a fall in diastolic, this is typically called as ventriculization of pressure. And if both systolic and diastolic are damped, then this is a dampened uh, uh, pressure. And as I just discussed, if the second cause, that is the coronary spasm, 
is the cause for dampening of pressure, then you need to give vasodilators uh, like nitroglycerin in order to get uh, over this. Uh, there are other problems with guiding catheters like untwisting a guide. Uh, <coughs> sometimes the guide catheters get twisted. So the basic principle lies to be able to pull them down in the broadest possible area. Typically, you know, beyond the branch, uh, uh, beyond the arch of aorta, you are, if you are able to pull it down, then you put in a uh, O35 stiff wire or a O38 stiff wire and try to rotate it clockwise or anti-clockwise in a bid to get beyond the point uh, of kink. And once your wire is outside the uh, catheter, then you can uh, just uh, uh, pull it out. Another common problem we very often face is that when we hook the right coronary uh, artery, we enter into the conus branch. Uh, this is simply because the catheter size is undersized in this case. So use a size bigger than that. Say if you're using a JR 3.5, use a JR 4 in such situations and you will get over the problem of, uh, you know, entering the conus branch repeatedly. Now, as far as the backup support are con is concerned, sometimes uh, you need a very stable guide which has um, got a very strong backup support because each time you take your hardware, the guide uh, tries to come out. So the supports can be passive, active or balanced. Passive basically means that the shape of the catheter is such that it is supporting your, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the guide is supported. Uh, the typical example of a passive support is the amplats uh, that we talked about. You can use the amplats left or amplats right, or even sometimes in case of uh, right coronary, you can use the amplats left. Active support typically means that you deep seat the catheter, as is shown here uh, in the bottom left, uh, bottom right part. Uh, for the LED, if you give a little counterclockwise turn, it can engage better, it can deep hook better. And if you give a clockwise turn for the right and for the circumflex, that is a better way to uh, get into a good uh, support. The <clears throat> for the coaxial alignment, uh, you need to know uh, whether the anatomy is complex or you've got a uh, uh, you know, tortuosity or need for extra support. If yes, you can use support uh, from the sinus of Valsalva and you can use extra support which will be from the opposite aortic wall. And if not, uh, no, then you use the standard catheters. So for, uh, you know, from sinus of, uh, support from sinus of Valsalva, you typically have the amplats right and the amplats left. You also have the hockey stick uh, catheter and the multipurpose catheter. Uh, power guides would be the typical uh, ones that are used are extra backup catheter, the VODA, and uh, the extra backup right. These are the typical extra support catheters. So for uh, left coronary artery disease, uh, typical catheters that we use are Judkins. If the takeoff is very high, we can use an Amplats left or we can use an extra backup. If there is a short uh, uh, left main, then uh, um, if there is a short left main, then we, see we should use a, a left Judkins. And if there is a long left main, then we can use Amplats or uh, we can use an extra backup. For right coronary interventions, uh, <coughs> the uh, sometimes the right uh, coronary takeoff may be actually dipping down as is shown in the bottom left uh, uh, um, cartoon. And in that case, you use either a size bigger than what you're using. For example, in a JR 3.5, you use a JR 4, you'll be able to sort it out. Or you use a multipurpose catheter and, and that is it. Sometimes there is a deformed, uh, you know, an abnormal takeoff in which the right coronary uh, ostium is looking up and then the right coronary is coming down. In such, uh, you have specific catheters like the Shepherd's Crook catheter or the Amplats left can also be used in these uh, situations. For coronary anomalies, if you have a coronary artery from the right sinus, typically a left or a right amplats or a multipurpose catheter is good. Or if you have an anomalous 
the coronary artery originating from the left sinus, then you use an amplat, uh, a left amplat, or you use a larger sized uh, Judkins catheter. Now, if you have a saphenous vein graft uh, <coughs> for um, unusual positions, you use a multipurpose catheter or an amplat left catheter. For internal mammary, you have a dedicated catheter called the IMA catheter, and that should be uh, best used. Uh, as far as radial is concerned, radial one can go ahead and do uh, the procedures with the standard catheters, that is the Judkins left and right. Uh, what is important to remember is that when you approach from the radial, like we are a radial center, uh, so typically uh, whatever size you use in Indian patients uh, for, the left, uh, for the left or for the right, uh, you should use a size 0.5 smaller than that. So if you use a Judkins 3.5 for a femoral approach, you should use a Judkins 3 for a radial approach. Uh, likewise, if you use a Judkins 4 for, uh, uh, you know, for a right uh, coronary catheterization, you should use a Judkins 3.5. Another simple dictum uh, that we follow is that uh, usually the Judkins right uh, has to be chosen 0.5 above the size of the left coronary catheter. Uh, another thing which is very helpful is the use of Ikari catheters which are shown here and uh, um, we also use these uh, quite often and uh, we find that these support the uh, these support the radial approach much better than the conventional catheters. Now based on all these this is uh, this is the kind of summary slide for the choice of uh, catheters. So if you have a right coronary, which is normal in origin and course, you use a Judkins right. If you have an anterior uh, ectopic origin, you use an Amplatz right or a hockey stick. If you have an inferior or superior, uh, you know, origin uh, or uh, course, then you use a multipurpose catheter. Uh, <clears throat> likewise, these are uh, highlighted here. I need not go into details of each one. So what the examiners are fond of sometimes are, they may ask you what is this? Which catheter is this? Um, this is actually a catheter which is used for the renal angioplasty. So this is a RDC catheter, a 55 centimeters RDC catheter. This is used for renal stenting. Uh, <coughs> There are some time, some, it's not possible to remember all the types of catheters. This, uh, the one on this left, this is called the Michelson catheter. We, uh, somebody told us we were trying to find out uh, bronchial arteries. Uh, uh, you know, there were, there was a case of congenital heart disease uh, and uh, we had to find out bronchopulmonary collaterals. So somebody suggested this catheter, so I brought the picture of this. Uh, this is a cobra catheter. So sometimes your examiner may want to show you a particular shape. If you're uh, lucky enough to have read about it, very good. But uh, uh, I can tell you, uh, you, you only know about the catheters which you actually use in day-to-day -day practice and some other catheters. Now, further down for support, you have these micro catheters and these are the ones which are available in the market. Uh, people use Guidezilla and uh, Guideliner. Uh, <coughs> uh, the, the, the differences uh, in the, sh I mean, the basic difference in the shape can help you to understand as to what is uh, the difference. Uh, this is the most uh, typical, uh, you know, microcatheter that we use. Uh, the microcatheter types depend from brand to brand, but this is a Teriumo microcatheter. Uh, uh, which we uh, standardly use in Indian labs. Um, the purpose of using these microcatheters or support catheters is that it increases the force of the wire. And typically, a one gram catheter, one gram tip load, um, you know, can increase to five grams if you are using a support catheter. There are others like this Tornus. Uh, this is a Taurus again um, by Asahi. Uh, the feature of this is that, as you can see, there are you know spiral grooves in this. 
and so when you are going through a CTO you can actually drill a bit through the CTO that's the main advantage of this and also because it has got a you know tapering course uh, it helps you to drill across uh, the lesion along with the wire tip uh, you have similarly Corsair you uh, these are some of the American support catheters uh, I could get the picture I have never seen them these are the turnpike catheters and turnpike also has some catheters which are similar to uh, you know Corsair and Tornus uh, so these are other typical catheters which are available another important group of catheters that are now available is what are the what are called as the dual lumen access catheters typically um, there are you know situations like no flow situation so if you have these catheters you can take them across and uh, you can go over the wire through one of the lumens and through the other lumen you can actually inject you can you can also uh, use them in case uh, you are approaching a bifurcation and through the other lumen you can go across the bifurcation so this is a twin pass catheter uh, <clears throat> this is again an american set of uh, micro catheter family these are just for the record these are mamba uh, catheters now talking about the ptca balloons uh, <coughs> the perfusion balloons are no longer available so you have typically the otws or the over the wire balloons and the rapid exchange balloons or the monorail balloons that we use uh, usually the cutting balloons and the scoring uh, balloons like the angio sculpt they are particularly used in very hard fibrotic lesions or calcified lesions uh, to be able to they cut through the lesion so they decrease the chances of uh, you know dissection they give a more predictable expansion of the uh, lesion uh, this is uh, typically uh, what is an over the wire balloon so you need to use a long wire the guide wire that you use has to be a 300 centimeters or a two, uh, 260 centimeters wire and over this through one lumen you uh, enter the guide wire uh, uh, enter through the guide wire and this is a very supporting uh, balloon because the entire length of the balloon is over the guide wire so uh, in terms of support the OTW balloon is in terms of support and uh, you know penetration power it's extremely good but the limitations of this are that you cannot uh, you know detect the tip because it doesn't have a radio uh, opaque uh, tip and also the contrast injection is not possible uh, because you've got a wire there and uh, of course you can pull out the wire and then you can give the contrast injection at the tip this is another balloon um, this is not a coronary uh, this is not a coronary catheter this is another catheter so if uh, anybody can tell me which catheter is this say that this is a Berman catheter a Berman catheter is used for right ventricular injection as you can see in this the balloon is at the tip and the holes are prior to the balloon so when you inject you are going to inject in the RV cavity and not cause problems this is a this is a very familiar thing a rota burr uh, further coming to guide wires the guide wires have uh, you know they have a core and they have a tip so the guide wires have been classified on the basis of core material diameter and whether they taper or not they've also been based on the basis of their covers and coatings which may be you know ptfe or polymer coating and uh, 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 ptfe or polymer covers and coatings which may be hydrophilic or hydrophobic and based upon how they taper that also helps so this is these are the various factors or criteria on the basis of which the guide wires have been categorized uh, the guide wires most of us uh, try to be familiar with one particular or one particular set of guide wires and the guide wire that you use in mostly more than 70 percent of your cases are typically called your workhorse wires uh, <coughs> the wires will depend upon the core material uh, which will give you flexibility or support and tracking and also the tapers which will determine whether your wire will be able to track 
or not um, ultimately uh, if you if you look at the uh, guide wires two things are important uh, one thing most important is the tactile feedback and that will depend upon the lubricity and uh, certain other features which are highlighted here particularly the hydrophilic or the hydrophobic coating which will or no coating at all which will increase your tactile feedback uh, basic principles in wires are that you should try and familiarize yourself with a group of wires rather than trying to do everything uh, i'll finish in a little while <coughs> So these are some typical wires that we use, Fielder XT, Confianza Pro. Uh, this is like uh, a large number of wires put up in one particular slide. And as we see, you have a set of wires which are workhorse wires. There are wires which support you a lot, like the Grand Slam and the Iron Man wire. You have polymer wires which will just wisp through uh, any uh, you know, tortuous lesion. You have CTO wires, uh, which include very stiff wires or tapered wires. Uh, <coughs> so uh, beyond that, OK, uh, two or three uh, things more. Uh, what is this? Uh, can uh, anybody make out? Yeah, so this is this picture I could get from a very old journal. This is the typical type of Kono's uh, bioptome or King's bioptome, as they were called. And at this question says, what are the two best indications of endomyocardial biopsy? Besides graft rejection, the two main indications are if you have a new onset of heart failure within two weeks or within two, two weeks to three months with uh, a dilated left ventricle or new onset ventricular arrhythmias or heart blocks, these are the two major indications why uh, you should do a endomyocardial biopsy. Talking about contrast-induced nephropathy, uh, it is defined as an increase in serum creatinine by more than 25% or an absolute increase of 0.5 milligrams per deciliter within three days. We need to understand that typically the contrast-induced nephropathy occurs after 48 hours it occurs typically at 48 to 72 hours. It doesn't occur immediately. And the main thing is that <clears throat> the main thing is that the main route of elimination of contrast media is the kidney. And what it does is it decreases the vasodilatory agents and increases the vasoconstrictor agents. And it also causes osmotic, uh, uh, you know, diuresis. So that those are the major reasons why contrast-induced nephropathy occurs. Uh, contrast-induced nephropathy is uh, likely, more likely to happen if the eGFR of a given patient is less than 45. If the patient has normal renal functions, they are able to tolerate a larger amount of contrast. But if they are not, and plus if they have risk factors like diabetes, dehydration, congestive heart failure, age more than 70 or co-administration of nephrotoxic drugs, then this problem gets highlighted. Um, <clears throat> for prevention, uh, <clears throat> do, do, what do we do? Uh, do we volume expand? The answer is yes. Do we use a low osmolar or an isoosmolar uh, contrast? Plus minus answer. Uh, can, should we do prophylactic hemodialysis? The answer is no. The only thing is if patient actually goes into contrast-induced nephropathy, then sometimes they may need hemodialysis. Now, the best, the best handling of contrast-induced nephropathy is to prevent it. Two things are important. One is hydrate these patients well. And the second thing is always calculate the EGFR. Please learn and also teach your residents to calculate the EGFRs. They are available on apps. Use a CKD EPI method. There are several methods to calculate the EGFR. Use a CKD EPI method to calculate the EGFR. Multiply the EGFR by a value of 3.75, and that is the total amount of dye that you can give to the patient. This is a, a European Society of Cardiology class one recommendation. For hydration, so there are several controversies in this area. 
um, to use the NAC or not, well, uh, <coughs> N-acetylcysteine uh, is no good. Uh, we do continue to give it, but it is uh, in, in studies that have been done, it has not been found to be useful. Should we use sodium bicarbonate or normal saline? Most comparative studies have shown that normal saline is still the best possible drug. Uh, we need to stop nephrotoxic drugs, if possible, even drugs like metformin that our diabetic patients are uh, on. Uh, should we use a low osmolar or a isoosmolar uh, contrast? Uh, again, there are no differences. The major difference is, uh, you know, the major determining factor is the amount of dye you use. So calculate EGFR, multiply it by 3.75, calculate the dose of the dye, and that's how you go about it. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Vansal. Uh, I think uh, you have shown the probably uh, the answers for all the questions that are being asked routinely in the examinations. I hope uh, there will be a minimal questions left over. You have done a good, good job, excellent.